First lesson. You're an excellent doctor. Thank you. You're very polite. This is my brother, John. Hello, I'm David. Oh dear, we're late again. It isn't my fault. There isn't a clock in my house. This isn't very difficult. Not at all. It's easy. She isn't very pretty. No, but she's kind. I'm sure this is our house. No, it isn't. I am. I'm. You are. You're. It is. It's. He is. He's. We are. We're. Isn't. He isn't late. Aren't. We aren't polite. Second lesson. Where are you? We're here, in the house. But where's John? He's there, near the trees. There in the house, but John isn't. He's near the trees. Where are my cigarettes? Are they on the table? Yes, they are. And my paper, where is it? It's there, on the chair. Where's my paper? Your paper is there. It's near the television. Thank you. You're very kind. Where's John? Where are my cigarettes? Here. There. In. On. Third lesson. Here's the book. Is it interesting? Yes, it's very interesting. There are the papers. Where are they? There, on the bookcase. Thank you. Here's your tea, James. Sugar. No, thank you. Milk. Yes, please. Ow! It's very hot. I'm sorry. Where's the ashtray? Here, with my cigarettes. Where are the matches? There, near your hand. Thanks very much. Here's your tea. Here are my cigarettes. There's the radio. There are the matches. It's hot. It isn't very interesting. Hand. Bookcase. Matches. Yes, please. No, thank you. Fourth lesson. This is my sister. How old is she? She's thirteen.
This is our garden. Is it big? Not really. These are my parents. Are they old? I'm not sure. This is our new car. It's a big red car. That is our library. It's a small library. Is this Station Street? No. You're in Bridge Street. Station Street is over there. Where? Near those shops. An old car, but a new bike. Our parents are in the car. A small house with a big garden. Hello, John. Where are your parents? I'm not really sure. Perhaps they're at the shops. Ah, here they are. Fifth lesson. There's a good program on the television. There are always good programs on Saturday. There are always friends in the house. Is Michael in his room? Probably. The door of his room is open. Here is Peter and his friend Anne. This is her brother, Paul. Her brother is very clever. He's an architect. Yes, but his clothes are terrible. Yes, his tailor probably isn't rich. Where are Jim and Steve? They aren't here yet. Well, There's still time. They're very rude. They're always late. Clever. Probably. Open. Sixth lesson. Hello. How are you? Very well, thanks. And you? Oh, I'm all right. Ah, what's the matter? It's Monday, the first day of the week. I'm never well on Monday. Where's the high street, please? This is the high street. Of course. Thanks very much. Is that your car? <laughs> no. My boss is still abroad. It's his car. What's that? That is the cassette player. And this is the cigarette lighter. Very nice. Is your boss often abroad? Not often enough. Is his brother in yet? No, not yet. I'm well. We're tired. It's Monday again. Sugar? No, thank you. This is enough. How is your sister? Not very well. Seventh lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Eighth lesson. Can I help you? 
Have you got any tea? Of course. Do you want some? Yes, please. Give me two pounds and a packet of biscuits. Do you want some beans? No, thanks. We've got some at home. Well, some bread. Yes, please. Two loaves. Oh, and half a pound of butter. That's all. How much is that? That's six pounds. Oh dear, I've only got five pounds. You can pay the rest next time. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, madam. Ninth lesson. I've got some. I don't want any. Have you got any peas, please? Yes, I've got some big tins. Is anyone at home? I can hear someone. Yes, it's me. I'm in the kitchen. Do you want a cup of tea? Yes, please. Come in then. Have a cigarette. Thank you. I haven't got any. These are good. Yes, they're Turkish. I've got a pipe, but I prefer cigarettes. A pipe isn't as dangerous as cigarettes. I know, but it isn't as good. Have you got a light? Thanks. Tenth lesson. On the telephone. Hello. Who is this? Oh, good morning, sir. No. He's not here. Have you got his office number? Wait a minute. Um, it's four two six eight. Ask for extension thirty five. It's a pleasure. Goodbye. Hello. Who? No, I'm sorry. You've got the wrong number. That's all right. Goodbye. Have you got a minute? This sentence is very strange. I'm fed up. It's an idiom. It means I'm bored. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Don't mention it. Eleventh lesson. I play. We play. You play. He or she plays. I speak. We speak. You speak. She or he speaks. We play tennis in the morning, and our neighbors play in the evening. They have a tennis court in their garden. Do you want to play? Yes, but I haven't got much time. Here's a racket for you. There are some balls in the garden. Are you ready? Service. Out. That's enough for today. I'm tired already. 
I know someone who plays as well as you. My girlfriend speaks Russian. Do you speak Russian? Unfortunately, no. Does she speak Greek too? No, she doesn't. Do you speak Greek? No, I don't. But I play tennis well. Yes, you do. Too well for me. Twelfth lesson. Do I play? Do we play? Do you play? Do they play? Does he or does she play? I don't play. We don't play. You don't play. They don't play. He or she doesn't play. I like cars, but I don't like motorbikes. Do you like sugar in your coffee? Yes, please, and a little milk. She plays the piano, but not very well. Fortunately, she doesn't play the violin. Do you play rugby? Oh no, I'm too old. Can I help you? Do you sell socks? Do you want anything from the shop? I have something important to tell you. Do you play bridge? No, I don't. Well, something else, perhaps. Poker. Yes, but I don't play for money. We play bridge. She doesn't play the violin. Thirteenth lesson. Where do you live? I live in London. Do you like it? Yes, I like big cities. Do you? Not really. I prefer the country. How do you spend your evenings in the country? I read. I work in the garden. My wife paints. Does she paint portraits? No, she paints the bathroom and the hall. Does your wife like the country too? No, she prefers hotels in London. To read is the infinitive of the verb. She likes to read novels. I prefer to live in the country. She doesn't like to live in the country. There is a lot of work. Fourteenth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Fifteenth lesson. Let's meet David. Hello, I'm David Wilson. I live in a suburb of London. It's called Harrow. There's a famous school here. I work in London. I'm a journalist on the Daily Mail. I travel to work by tube. I go from the station to the office. 
on foot. What's his name? He's David Wilson. Where does he live? He lives in Harrow. Does he travel to work by car? No. He takes the tube. He doesn't take his car. Hello. I'm David Wilson. I'm a journalist. My wife's a secretary. We both work in London. Sixteenth lesson. Where do you live? I live in a suburb called Harrow. How do you go to work? I take the tube every morning. Why do you take the train? You've got a car. There is too much traffic, and there are too many people. And petrol is too expensive. When do you use your car? At weekends. We go to the country. We go to Windsor. Quite often. I don't know Windsor. I'm going there on Saturday. Do you want to come? Hmm. Yes, please. Too much traffic. Too many cars. Too much noise. Too many people. Seventeenth lesson. What time is your train? At eight thirty. Well, hurry up. It's eight fifteen already. All right. Keep calm. But David, you're late. Don't shout. I can hear you. Where are my shoes? Here, with your briefcase. Okay, I'm ready. Oh, at last! What time is it now? It's twenty past eight. Right, I'm off. Bye, bye, love. Goodbye. It's now twenty-five past eight. David is at the station. He has his paper under his arm. His briefcase is on the platform, and he is waiting for the eight thirty train. It's never on time, he says impatiently. What time is it? Hurry up! I'm off. Eighteenth lesson. Husband and wife. On the train, David reads his paper. He stands, because the train is full. People that travel to work every day are called commuters. The journey takes twenty minutes, and he has ten minutes to walk to the office. He hasn't much time, so he walks quickly. He crosses the city and arrives at his office. He takes the lift to the fourth floor. He goes to his desk and sits down. He is on time. His wife Joan washes the dishes. And leaves the house at ten to nine. Her office is quite near, so she always walks. It takes her eight minutes to arrive at her office. 
She is a secretary in an accountant's firm. At nine o'clock, both the Wilsons are working. Nineteenth lesson. Answer these questions about lesson eighteen. What does David do on the train? Does he sit down? What are commuters? How long does the journey take? Does he walk quickly? Why? On what floor is his office? Does he arrive on time? What does his wife do with the dishes? What time does she leave the house? Is her office near or far? Her office is near the house. It is close. The shop closes at six o'clock. Please sit down. No, I prefer to stand. Twentieth lesson. Have you got any cigarettes? Yes. What kind do you want? Oh, Turkish ones, please. Here you are, sir. Thank you. How much is that? Fifty pence, please. My son's a doctor of philosophy. Oh, good. What kind of illness is philosophy? A bargain. Do you want a carpet, sir? Here are some beautiful carpets. How much is that little one? It is a real Oriental carpet, sir. It is magnificent. It costs fifty pounds. Ridiculous! That's much too dear. Well, make me an offer. Fifty pence, and not one penny more. What? Fifty pence for this real Turkish carpet? Well, take it, sir. It's yours. Twenty-first lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Twenty-second lesson. At the weekend. At the weekend, people usually do not work. On Sunday, everything is closed, except the cinemas, and a few shops. Few people leave London, but many go to the parks. There are many parks in London. And there is much grass. In the parks, you can walk anywhere, except on the lakes. At the weekend, there is always too little time, and too much to do. Football is very popular, and many people go and watch matches on Saturday. You can also go to the cinema, or the theatre, or simply walk through the streets. But on Monday, you go back to work. Sunday. Monday. Tuesday. Wednesday. Thursday. Friday. Saturday. On Saturday.
at the weekend. In October. Twenty third lesson. Can I help you? Mummy, can I have some sweets? You can, but you may not. Oh, Mummy, may I have some sweets? Of course, dear. Help yourself. Can I help you? Yes, please. I want a map of London. Do you like this one? It's very detailed. Yes, that's fine. How much is it? Well, it costs twenty pence, but you can have it for fifteen pence. Where can I find a telephone? You can find one at the end of the street. May I ask you something? Of course. Can you tell me the time? My watch doesn't work. Certainly. It's exactly two o'clock. Twenty-fourth lesson: an unwelcome conversation. Excuse me. May I sit down? Please do. Thanks very much. Ah, that's better. My name's Brian Sellers. Oh, very interesting. Yes, I work in London. Do you work in London too? Yes, I do. Have a cigarette. No, thank you. This is a non-smoking compartment. Oh. Do you mind if I smoke? Yes, I do. I'm cold. Are you cold too? No, I'm not. Oh, you have a paper. I don't like reading. I prefer talking. Yes, I see. No, you hear. <laughs> Goodbye, sir. Oh, goodbye. Do you mind if I smoke? Mind your head. He's cold. He's hot. He's unlucky. Twenty-fifth lesson. A polite conversation. David and his wife are at a party. David is talking to a tall, good-looking woman. Hello, my name's David Wilson. I'm Susan Bryce. What do you do, David? I'm a journalist. Oh, how interesting! Do you write for the Times? No, I work on the Daily Whale, but I hope to change soon. And what about you? Oh, I'm an author. I'm writing a book about British painters. Have we got any? <laughs> Don't be silly. Of course we have. People like Constable, Turner, and so on. But it's taking a long time because the information is difficult to find. May I read it when it's finished? With pleasure. Oh dear, my wife's looking at me. I'd better go. What do you do? I'm an author. What are you doing? I'm learning English. Twenty-sixth lesson. Can you lend me five pounds? But I don't know you. That's exactly why I'm asking you. 
Jane, why do you always come to school with dirty hands? Well, miss, I haven't got any others. At the concert. This piece is a symphony by Mozart. I suppose it is something new. What? Don't you know that Mozart is dead? Excuse me, I never read the papers. He never talks to me. Don't ever say that. Say, he always talks to other people. A nervous passenger. I'm scared of the water. Don't be silly. People never drown in these waters. Are you sure, young man? Of course I am. The sharks never let anybody drown. Twenty seventh lesson. Some idioms. Here are some idioms. We already know some of them. Please close the window. My wife is cold. You are very lucky to have a charming wife. I don't want to swim. I'm scared of fish, especially sharks. You are right. It's very hot outside, but I'm not hot. I'm going to bed. I'm very sleepy, and it's late. You're wrong. Today is the twenty-fifth, and not the twenty-sixth. Come close to the fire. You're very cold. You're right. I'm freezing. I haven't got a coat, and it's snowing. She's scared of ghosts, and I'm afraid of the dark. I'm afraid I can't come. I have an important appointment. Never mind. You can come on Friday instead. The months of the year are January, February, March, April, May. June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Twenty eighth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Twenty ninth lesson. Let's meet our friends, the Wilsons, again. At the office, David has a lot of work. He receives calls from people who phone to offer him information. If he can, he goes out to see them. But if he is too busy, he sends a colleague. Because his is a daily paper, the amount of work is huge. At her office, Joan types her boss's letters and answers the phone. She only works part time, so she goes home at half past twelve. Then she does the housework, because they cannot afford a help. When she finishes, she makes a cup of tea and reads a magazine. Then she starts preparing David's dinner. David usually arrives home about half past six, but sometimes he works late and does not arrive home until nine o'clock.
Thirtieth lesson. Hello, Joan. Is David in? No, I'm afraid not. He isn't home yet. Is he still working? Yes. Sometimes he works until nine. Oh well, I can't wait. Tell him there's a darts match at the pub tonight. What time? About half past eight. If he's back in time, I'll tell him. Thanks. Bye, Joan. Bye, Pete. Hurry up! I'm not ready yet. Are you still waiting to marry a millionaire? He always asks for money, and I never have any. I can still remember a few words of German. Tell him about the match when he comes in. Thirty-first lesson: eating. Sometimes David and Joan go out to eat. There are very few English restaurants where they live. Most of them are either Indian or Chinese, with a few Italian ones. They like Indian food, though Joan finds it very hot. The meals are quite cheap, and there is a lot to eat. They eat curry and rice and fruit, and Joan drinks a lot of water. You can find English food in pubs. As well as beer, but they shut quite early. Hello, darling. Hello, love. Do you want to go out to a restaurant tonight? Nah, I've cooked a roast. We're going to eat in. Okay, I'll go and buy some wine at the off license. Yes, but don't stop to play darts. No. The darts match was last night. Thirty-second lesson. Here are some sentences with the verbs of the last few lessons. Joan types letters all morning. David receives a call from a friend. Joan cooks at home, if she is not too tired. Is your husband still working? Yes, he is not home yet. Wait for him; he's extremely busy. The phone is ringing. Answer it, please. His wife works full time. But he only works part time. I can't afford a new car; they're too expensive. Let's go out to a restaurant tonight. No thanks, I'm not hungry, but I am thirsty. Let's go to the pub. Thirty-third lesson. Mr. Marsden is David's boss. He is the editor of the newspaper for which David works. There are many responsibilities in his job, but he enjoys it very much. In his wife's opinion, there are too many responsibilities. She never sees him. She prefers her son's job. He is a bank clerk. And is home every day at six. His job is not as well paid as his father's, but he works less, and the holidays are better. In England, twice a year, there is a day's holiday called a bank holiday. I'll be home late tonight, dear. Why? 
I've got a new article about taxation to prepare. But you always go to the office early and come home late. I can't help it. An editor's life, you know. Huh. And his wife's life. I'll see you tonight, love. Goodbye. Thirty-fourth lesson. We'll see you tomorrow night at half past seven. I've got nothing to do, and it makes me tired. Her husband drinks too much, or that is her opinion. His wife's spending worries him. You'll meet his son next week. He's coming to visit us. His son's record player is much too noisy. My daughter always complains that I work too much. The man for whom I work is very mean. He doesn't pay me enough. Please excuse me. It is not my fault. I don't want to go home. May I come with you? Is it far to the tube station? No, about five minutes' walk. What is the maximum penalty for bigamy? Two mothers-in-law. Thirty-fifth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Thirty-sixth lesson. David and Joan are going to the Marsdens for dinner. They arrive at seven thirty, and Mr. Marsden opens the door and invites them in. Come into the sitting room and sit down. What will you have to drink? A whisky for me. Joan, what will you have? A sherry, if I may. Dry, please. He serves the drinks, and they all sit down. Mrs. Marsden comes downstairs and joins them. The cook comes in and says. Dinner is ready. They go into the dining room. The meal is excellent. They eat soup, lamb, fruit salad, and cheese. Oh, you're very lucky to have a cook, Mrs. Marsden," says Joan. Yes, you see, I have so little time to cook. So do I. David doesn't earn enough money, so there is an embarrassed silence. Have a brandy," says Mr. Marsden. Thirty-seventh lesson. Directions. Can you tell me the way to the British Museum?、Mm, let me see. Yes. Are you on foot? Yes, I am. Well, go up Charing Cross Road and take Shaftesbury Avenue. You come to New Oxford Street. Ah,、uh, then it's ah、uh, just opposite, I think. Yes, that's it. Just opposite is Bloomsbury Street. Sorry, say that again. Just opposite, you've got Bloomsbury Street. Go down there. And it's on your right. You can't miss it. Thanks very much. That's okay. Have another beer. I don't want one, but have one yourself. I will. I'm very thirsty. You're always thirsty. <laughs> Perhaps it's because I don't drink enough. A glutton. A mother to her son, after the sixth piece of cake. Tom, 
You are a glutton. How can you eat so much? I don't know. It's just good luck. Thirty eighth lesson. At the pub. David and Pete are playing darts. I'm good, Pete, but I think you're better. Oh, no. That's not true. Oh, sixty. Perhaps you're right. Hey, look, you're closer than me. Yes, but I'm short sighted. That's no excuse. You can see from here? Yes, but not very well. Anyway, I don't always win. But you can buy the drinks. You're richer than me. All right. What do you want? I want to win. Pete is richer than David, but David is happier. I'm bigger than you. Yes, but I'm more intelligent. How is your poor father? He's worse, I'm afraid. This is the best way to go to the museum. Close. Closer. Closest. Rich. Richer. Richest. Good. Better. Best. More intelligent. Most intelligent. Thirty ninth lesson. London. London is larger than Paris, but smaller than New York. There are more than eight million inhabitants in Greater London, more than the populations of Scotland and Wales together. Inner London is smaller. Here you find the West End, with its theatres, and the city, which is the financial centre of England. It is also the oldest part of London and still has some ancient traditions. For example, the Lord Mayor of London is mayor of the city only. The most important part of the city is the Stock Exchange, which is as important as the Bourse in Paris. In almost every street, there is a beautiful church. Often designed by Wren. Among the places of interest to see are Trafalgar Square, with its colony of pigeons and four bronze lions, and the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben. In fact, it is the bell and not the clock which is called Big Ben. Fortieth lesson. Useful expressions. Can I help you? Yes, I'm looking for. Please sit down. You look tired. Have a drink. What will you have? Can you tell me the way to the town centre? London is larger than Paris. But smaller than New York. Please come in. Make yourself at home. Sorry. Say that again. I don't like beetroot. No, neither do I. <sighs> Can't you do better than that? This lesson is more interesting than the first one. I can't speak English fluently yet, but I can understand quite well. Please speak a little slower. Thanks. How far is it from London to Edinburgh? He won't speak to you. He's in a bad mood. Fortieth 
Forty-first lesson. Success. Peter and Dave are fishing. I've got a bite. Is it a trout? Oh, no, it's a wasp. Innocence. Please drink your tea, Mr. Williams. I want to watch you. Of course, my dear. But why? Because, Mummy says you drink like a fish. A Scottish prayer. Heavenly Father, bless us and keep us all alive. There are eight of us for dinner, and there's only enough for five. What is the longest word in English? I don't know. Smiles, because there's a mile between the first and the last letter. Keep quiet in the library. People are reading. I don't want this old pullover. You can keep it. Forty-second lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Forty-third lesson. The future. We will now look at the future tense. You form the future by putting will in front of nearly all our verbs. For instance, the verb to dress in the future becomes, "I will dress, you will dress." We continue with the contraction. We'll dress. You'll dress. They'll dress. You see, it's easy. Let's look at some sentences in the future. I'll go to the cinema tonight if you'll come with me. You will learn English quickly if you read a lesson every day. The word shall is mainly used for suggestions. It's raining. Shall we take a taxi? How much money will you need? Shall I give you some more? Will you give me some more coffee, please? How will you go to work? The tube's on strike. I'll take my car. Shall I phone the office and tell them you'll be late? I'll drive. You'll be late. You will have problems. Forty-fourth lesson. Give me that wallet. It's mine. How do you know? Well, it's not yours, and there are ten pounds inside it. He borrows my things, but he isn't pleased when I borrow his. These people are all friends of hers. They want to come to the party. What? All of them?、Uh, well, perhaps only a few of them. Where is my pen? Here,、yeah, you can use mine. That's very kind of you. Whose is this sports car? It's theirs. I suppose they are very rich. No, their house is smaller than yours. In fact, they live in a tent. A cynic. So you're going to marry Harold? What's he like? Ah, <sighs> he's honest, kind, gentle, sweet, and noble. And what are you going to eat? A cynic is a person who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. Forty-fifth lesson. 
Holiday plans. David and Joan are discussing their plans. I think we'll go to Brighton next weekend. But why? There's nothing to do at this time of the year. I know. But look, if the weather is fine, we can drive along the coast and visit all those little villages. Yes, but、uh, David,、um, my mother's coming next weekend. Damn! But she only comes once a year. Yes, and it's always when we want to go away. You mean when you want to go away? I'm sorry. She's arriving on Friday. Then we'll take her with us and visit the antique shops. She'll feel at home among all those old things. David, don't be nasty. I'll meet her at the station. Then we'll be able to make our plans together. Forty-sixth lesson. Read this lesson as usual. Then answer the questions about the preceding one. What are David and Joan doing? Where does David want to go next weekend? Does he want to go to Birmingham? Does he want to drive to Brighton? Who is arriving next weekend? How often does she come? What will they do? Do you think they will go by train? Will the weather be fine? Where will David meet his mother-in-law? When do people take their holidays? The four seasons are spring, summer, autumn, winter. Forty seventh lesson. An Englishman and a Frenchman are discussing their respective countries. Of course, says the Englishman, "You Frenchmen are not gentlemen." And why not? Replies his friend, slightly annoyed. Well, for example, if you enter a bathroom by mistake, and you see a young lady washing, what do you say? We say, "Excuse me, madam." Exactly, says the Englishman, but a gentleman says, "Excuse me, sir." A gentleman is a person capable of two things: he can describe a pretty girl without using gestures, and he always hears a funny story for the first time. Two English gentlemen are eating a meal in their club. They taste the soup with great interest, and one says to the other, "It's an interesting soup, but not a great soup." Forty-eighth lesson. How far is it to the station? Oh, not too far. It takes about ten minutes on foot, and only two by car. Shall I call you a taxi? No, thanks. I'll walk. I have plenty of time. A sociologist is studying the average height of the English. Do you know? He says to his girlfriend, "Only one Englishman in nine hundred and twenty is six feet tall." Yes, says the girl. But it's always him that sits in front of me in the cinema. A businessman is writing to a competitor, who is very dishonest. As my secretary is a lady, she cannot tell you what I think of you, and as I am a gentleman, I cannot even think it. But as you are neither one nor the other, I hope you understand. Forty-ninth lesson. Revision and notes.
No recording for this lesson. Fiftieth lesson. The past tense. We worked hard yesterday, and today we must look at something new. You looked at the lesson, and listened to the records or tapes, so now. You are ready to learn the past tense. It is very simple. You add ed to the infinitive if it ends in a consonant, and simply d to the infinitive ending in e. For example, to look, I looked. To work, he worked. To like, they liked. To smile. We smiled. There are, of course, some irregular verbs, but they aren't too complicated. Let's look at our old friends to be and to have. To have is extremely simple. It becomes had. You had, he had. To be has two forms. I was. He was, and you were, they were. You see how simple it is. We had dinner at eight o'clock. John and Peter were there. I had a cold last week, and I was quite ill. We hoped to see her, but she was busy. Fifty-first lesson: More past tenses. Was he at home yesterday? I think so, but I didn't phone. He called yesterday, but he didn't see me. Did he phone? I don't think so. These are the interrogative and negative forms in the past. You do not change the verb; you simply put the auxiliary do into the past. Did. I did not. Didn't like the food. He did not. Didn't phone. We did not. Didn't like him. Questions are easy too. Did he like it? Did she phone? Did you like the play last night? I didn't see it. But did you go to the theatre? Yes, but I was so tired I closed my eyes. Tell me, was the play interesting? I didn't understand very much. It was in Greek. Then why did you go? I liked the main actor. Did he act well? I didn't watch the acting. I looked at him. What did you do after the play? Ah, I dreamed about the actor. He did not. He didn't. He didn't like the play. Did they? Did they phone you? Fifty-second lesson. Here are a few more examples of regular verbs. In the present, in the past, and with the past participle. I hope. I hoped. I have hoped. He lives. He lived. He has lived. We finish. We finished. We have finished. They talk. They talked. They have talked. She changes. She changed. She has changed. You play. You played. You have played. Let's practice the past of do. Does he smoke? Did he smoke? We don't ask questions. We didn't ask questions. What do you do? What did you do? Does he wait? 
Did he wait? She doesn't answer. She didn't answer. Can and will are irregular and become could and would in the past. They have no past participle. I can begin now. I couldn't begin yesterday. He wouldn't work this morning, but he will now. I have, I've, I had. I am, I'm, we are, we're, I was, we were, I have been. Fifty third lesson. Difficult to please. A man is trying to entertain his guest in a club. Would you like a scotch? No, thank you. I tried it once and didn't like it. I never tried it again. Well, have some beer. No, thank you. I tried some once and didn't like it. I never drank it again. How about a game of billiards? No, thank you. I played it once and didn't like it. I never tried it again. Well, a game of chess. Again, no, thank you. I played it once and didn't like it. But here is my son. He is an excellent player. Your only son, I presume. What did you do in America? We rented a car and visited the West Coast. Did you see the Grand Canyon? No, we didn't have time. Fifty fourth lesson. Tell me more about your trip. Well, Peter and I took a plane to San Francisco. We stayed there for two days and went down to Monterey. There we saw Canary Row. Didn't someone write a book about that? Yes, John Steinbeck wrote one. They also held a pop festival there in the sixties. Then we drove to Los Angeles and visited Disneyland. Peter knew it already. I thought Disneyland was fantastic. It reminded me of the conciergerie in Paris. Hmm. What an educated person! It was my birthday last week. How old were you? Oh, at least thirty-two. The ten best years of a woman's life are those between twenty-nine and thirty. Your bill isn't paid yet. Didn't you receive my check? No, I didn't. I'll post it at once. Fifty-fifth lesson. When I was in America, I took some very good photos. Hello, how are you? I'm tired. I only came back from my trip yesterday. That was my wife's car. You saw me with. We heard about his trip and the things he did. It was very interesting. How about a glass of beer? No thanks. I'm not thirsty. Did you see him yesterday? No, I didn't. He didn't pay his bill because he didn't have any money. Who was that lady I saw you with last night? That wasn't a lady. That was my wife. We thought he had understood. What did you do on your first day at school? I learned to write. Already. Well, what did you write? I don't know. I can't read. Fifty-sixth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson.
Fifty seventh lesson. A touch of flu. David woke up with a headache and a sore throat. He called Joan and told her he felt ill. She took his temperature, and saw it was a hundred and two, one hundred and two degrees. So she called the doctor. David was sleeping when the doctor arrived. Hello, what's the matter with you? He felt David's forehead and listened to his chest. Then he said, "It's a touch of flu, nothing serious. Take these tablets and keep warm. You'll soon be on your feet." That doctor put me on my feet very quickly. Oh, how did he do that? I had to sell my car to pay the bill. On the face, you have the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. My head aches and my hands are cold. I think I have a touch of flu or a cold. Fifty-eighth lesson: Your body. There are many words in English, which include parts of the body. For instance, when I have the flu, I keep a supply of paper handkerchiefs. You look very busy. Can I give you a hand? Mr. Marsden is head of the board of directors. He is too nosy. He is interested in anything that. Doesn't concern him. Is trousers singular or plural? Please, sir, singular at the top, and plural at the bottom. That was a cheeky answer. The two runners were very close; they were almost neck and neck. When you are driving, always keep the spare wheel. Handy, and of course, when you're drinking your beer, you can say "chin chin." Other parts of the body are the arms, the elbows, and the fingers. Lower, we have the legs, the knees, the feet, and the toes. Fifty-ninth lesson. Men speak of women as the fair sex, or the gentle sex, or the weaker sex. Women rarely speak of men as the stronger sex. Some men think they are considered as the paying sex. My wife dreams every night that she's married to a millionaire. You're lucky. Mine dreams she's married to a millionaire. In the daytime, nature has given us ears which are always open, and a mouth which it is often better to keep shut. Two proud parents were showing their son his new brother. The boy looked at the baby for a minute, and then started crying. The parents smiled. "What's the matter?" they asked. <laughs> It's got no hair or teeth," the child sobbed. "It's not fair. It's an old baby." <laughs> We do not ask you to learn the irregular verbs in two or three days, but only to repeat them when we meet them. Sixtieth lesson: To get. Let's look at some expressions with the verb to get. These expressions are very common, and you already know a few. Here are some more. Try and learn them. He gets up at half past seven every morning. The train gets in. At eleven thirty, 
It took him a long time to get over his illness. Let's go home. It's getting dark. Speak louder. She's getting very deaf. These records are cheaper than those, but they are still quite expensive. Please go and get me a paper. I'm too busy to go myself. The burglar got into the house through a small window. Take a number thirty-seven bus and get off at Charing Cross. Everyone was trying to get on the bus at once. What's the matter? I've got a headache, a toothache, a sore throat, and a cold, and nobody asks me how I feel. Sixty-first lesson. Holidays. I got these brochures yesterday from the travel agents. Oh, good! Let's have a look at them. I like the ones about Spain. Let's go to Spain this year. But neither you nor I speak Spanish. It doesn't matter. In these towns, everybody speaks English. Well. We can either go to Spain, or to Scotland. Scotland. But it's cold in Scotland, and I want some sun. It's not too cold, and it's very beautiful, and you don't have to take a plane. I don't like flying, and neither do you. But Spanish is easier to understand. Than the English they speak in Scotland. Nonsense. Anyway, we might see the Loch Ness monster. It doesn't exist. How do you know? It's either a myth, or an invention to attract tourists. Well, we must decide: either Spain, or Scotland. Sixty-second lesson, Scotland. Scotland is half as big as England, but the population is much smaller. There are two main regions. In the north, the Highlands, which are wild and beautiful, and in the south, the Lowlands, which are more agricultural. Although Edinburgh is the capital. Glasgow is the main industrial centre. Scotland was separated from England by a wall built by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Parts of this wall still exist today. Some older people still speak Gaelic, but most Scots speak English. Scottish towns look very different from English ones. In English towns, the houses are mainly built of red brick, whereas in Scotland, the houses are mainly of grey slate. Britain's highest mountain, Ben Nevis, is in Scotland. The Scots have their own religion, called Presbyterianism, and their own laws. So, although Scotland is part of Great Britain. It has never been united with England, in the same way as Wales. Sixty-third lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Sixty-fourth lesson. When France and England decided to build a tunnel under the Channel, they asked for tenders. The firm with the lowest offer was accepted. Astonished by the low price, 
They asked the director, "How are you going to do it for so little money?" It's easy," the engineer said. "I will start digging on the English side, and my son will start digging on the French side, and we'll meet in the middle." But that's ridiculous. You'll be miles apart. What will happen if you don't meet? In that case, the engineer said calmly, "You will have two tunnels for the price of one." A tourist in Cairo saw two skulls in a shop, a large one and a small one. What are those? He asked. The big one is the skull of Queen Cleopatra, was the reply. Really, said the amazed tourist. And the little one? That is the skull of Cleopatra when she was a young girl," answered the shopkeeper. Don't forget to repeat the irregular verbs. Sixty-fifth lesson. Public transport. David Wilson travels to work every morning by tube. The tube. Or the underground is something like the metro in Paris, but unlike the metro, it is rather old-fashioned and quite expensive. You pay according to the distance you want to travel. You can buy a season ticket, which allows you to travel for a certain period at a lower price. Although most of the tube is automatic. There are still employees who check your ticket at the exit, so you must keep your ticket until you finish your journey. You can also travel by bus, which is slower, but gives you a better view. Most buses are double deckers, and you're allowed to smoke upstairs. On these buses, there is a driver and a conductor who collects your fares. Finally, there are the famous London taxis, or hackney cabs. These large, black, diesel-engined vehicles are a familiar sight in the capital. If the cab is free, you will see a little "for hire" sign in the front. Of course, the best way to see the city is on foot, but you need a rest from time to time. Sixty-sixth lesson. Learn this page as usual, then answer the questions with the help of the preceding lessons. What is the popular name for the underground? Where else can you find an underground railway system? What is it called? Is the tube expensive? Why is it dearer than the Parisian metro? Why must you keep your ticket until you reach the exit? What are London buses called? Can you smoke on a London bus? Where? Who collects the fares? Who drives the bus? What are hackney cabs? What colour are they? How do you know if a cab is free? Which is the best way to travel around London? Fares, please. Hyde Park, please. That's twelve pence. I don't know London.、Uh, will you tell me where I must get off? Of course. Oh, if you want to smoke, you must go upstairs. Sixty seventh lesson. We took my cousin to see a cricket match last month, but he fell asleep during the game. 
He slept peacefully for two hours, until a ball hit him on the head, and woke him up. Hello, it's nice to see you again. How are you? Very well. I'm going to stay with you for a few days. Ah, well, I'm leaving tomorrow, and my wife left two hours ago. Oh well. Goodbye. Mrs. Higgins put, "Rest in peace," on the tombstone of her husband's grave. Then the solicitor told her that there was nothing for her in her husband's will. So she told the mason to add the words, "Until I come." During the week, try to read this book for at least half an hour every day, and for a little longer at the weekend. This everyday contact will make you feel at home with English, and help you to build a wide vocabulary. But remember, read some English every day. Sixty-eighth lesson, sport. English people are very fond of sport. They play it and they watch it. They talk about it. And think about it. The most typically English game is cricket, which is played during the summer months. But the most popular game is football, which is played during the rest of the year, for eight months. Professional football is very exciting to watch, and the players earn large sums of money. Another ball game, less popular than football, is rugby. Called rugby football, it was invented at rugby school in about 1820. A boy called Ellis was so bored with playing with his feet that he took the ball in his hands, and a new game was born. Another popular sport is horse racing, which is forbidden in England on Sundays. There is no state lottery in England. But a game called bingo is very successful. Many cinemas are closing, and being converted into bingo halls. It is estimated that about six million people, mainly women, play bingo regularly. Sixty-ninth lesson. Excuse me. Doesn't my nephew Peter Bates work in this office? Oh, you're his uncle. Oh, he went to your funeral this morning. David, what are those empty whisky bottles doing in the cellar? I don't know, darling. I've never bought an empty bottle of whisky in my life. How many people work in your office? About half of them. Mrs. Thomas and Mrs. Jones met in the shopping centre. Mrs. Jones was pushing a pram with her two little boys inside. Good morning, Mrs. Jones. What beautiful children! Tell me, how old are they? Well, said Mrs. Jones. The doctor is two, and the lawyer is three. I forgot my wife's birthday. What did she say? Nothing. Well, that's all right then. Yes, nothing for three weeks. Don't forget to learn the irregular verbs we meet. Seventieth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Seventy-first lesson. Important news. Mr. Marshall and Mr. Hobbs were sitting in the seats near the door, opposite one another.
David Wilson got into the train and said, Good morning. The two men replied, Morning, and continued reading their papers. David put his briefcase on the rack over his head and sat down. He lit a cigarette, threw the match on the floor, and opened his paper. The three men read in silence for a while. The window was half open, and there was a strong draught. I see the Chinese Prime Minister is dead, said Marshall. No one said a word. After a few minutes, Hobbs said, Oh dear, another terrible plane crash. The other two showed no interest. Then David shouted, Oh no! The others looked at him. Styles, the Chelsea centre forward, is ill and won't be able to play against Spurs. The three men began to discuss the terrible, tragic news. Seventy second lesson. The train stopped at a station. But no one got on. At the last minute, the door opened, and an old gentleman with a grey beard and glasses got into the compartment. I just caught it, he said, sitting down heavily. He took off his glasses and wiped his face with a striped handkerchief. Everyone was reading and smoking, except the old gentleman. He had obviously had no time to buy a paper before catching the train. David soon noticed that the man was reading his paper with him, but very discreetly. David's paper had twenty pages, and he would have liked to share it with him. But he did not want to show the old gentleman that he had noticed he was reading it. He was afraid of offending him. David reached the bottom of the page, but did not want to turn it because his neighbour was still reading. At last, David solved the problem. He folded the paper, put it on the seat, closed his eyes. And pretended to be asleep. Seventy third lesson A Little Mystery. The police were interviewing a soldier suspected of robbery. I don't know the restaurant. I've never been there in my life, said the suspect. Well, people say. That a soldier like you robbed the restaurant and wounded the owner, replied the detective. But there must be thousands of soldiers in this town. Yes, but only one who was near the scene of the crime. Listen, I was walking quietly down the street when someone ran down the street shouting. He robbed the till. So I stopped and went back to the restaurant. And the witnesses said I was the robber because of my uniform. So the police arrested me. And here I am. You say you never saw the restaurant before? Yes. That's right, said the soldier nervously. Then I arrest you for armed robbery, said the detective. What was the soldier's mistake? The answer is in the revision lesson. Seventy fourth lesson. Let's learn some useful expressions. When English people meet for the first time, they say, 
How do you do? The answer is, how do you do? After this first meeting, you may say, how are you? Or simply, hello. Younger people find these formulas too formal and try to avoid them. People rarely shake hands in England. Here is a typical polite conversation. Hello, David. How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? I'm very well. Let me introduce Andrew Williams. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. Terrible weather, isn't it? Yes, but it's getting warmer now. I hope we will have some sun soon. Well, I must be off or I'll be late. Give my regards to your wife. Goodbye. I will. Take care of yourself. Goodbye. Seventy fifth lesson. We have seen a lot of words in the last few lessons. It is now time to revise some of them. He lit a cigarette, opened his novel, and began to read. Where did I put my briefcase? I can't remember. My young nephew was injured in a plane crash. He will not be able to come tomorrow, as he has an important meeting. The bank was robbed of fifty thousand pounds during the night. When you meet someone for the first time, you say, How do you do? They saw one another for the first time last week, although they write to one another regularly. I must be off. Or I'll be late for my appointment. You'll be able to recognize George. He wears glasses and a bowler hat. Don't forget the exercises at the bottom of the page. The door was half open, and he saw his parents playing cards. The weather is terrible, isn't it? Seventy sixth lesson Conditionals. What can I do for you, sir? I'd like to speak to Mr. Davies. I'm sorry, he isn't in. Would you like to see somebody else? No,、uh, but would you take a message for me, please? I'd be delighted. Would is the conditional in English and is placed in front of the infinitive. The contraction is easy. Would becomes d. For instance, I'd like a cup of tea. He'd help you. We'd prefer beer if you have any. Questions are easy too. Would you like a cup of tea? Would you help me, please? Here are some more sentences. He would understand if you spoke more slowly. He wouldn't ask for help if he didn't want it. He wouldn't need a teacher if he spoke fluently. A famous lawyer had lost a case and was very angry. If this is the law, he shouted. I'll burn my books. The judge replied, "It would be better if you read them." Seventy seventh lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Seventy-eighth lesson. Don't worry. We have seen many expressions and words already. 
And perhaps you are worried by some of the unusual ones, like they began to read or studying is easy. But if you read a lesson every day, you will come to know these words and idioms and will be able to use them naturally. You already know enough English to survive in England, and you know a little about the country. All this with just one lesson a day. But you must continue reading and writing. And do not worry about making mistakes. You make mistakes in your own language too. You probably want to speak fluently now, after only 11 weeks. But you should remember the saying You must learn to walk before you can run. Seventy ninth lesson. Have you seen that new film? You mean disaster? Yes, I saw it last week. Have you read Animal Farm? Yes, I read it when I was at school. Have you heard the joke about? Yes, I heard it ten years ago. When we are talking about a definite event in the past, we use the simple past tense. But when we are referring to the past in general, we use have or has with the past participle. You use this with words such as ever, before, already, and just. For example, I have read this book already. Or, he has never seen the snow. We say, she has already written five novels. But we must say, she wrote a novel last year. Or, she read the book last night. Am I the first man you have ever loved? He said. Of course, she replied. Why do men always ask the same question? Eightieth lesson. John saw his neighbour smoking a pipe. He took his own pipe out of his pocket and said, Have you got a match? Yes, here you are. Oh dear, said John. I've left my tobacco at home. In that case, said his neighbour, give me back my match. An actor saw himself on film for the first time. Yes, said the critic. Now you see what we have to suffer. Excuse me, sir. I want to marry your daughter. Have you seen my wife, young man? Yes, sir. And I still want to marry your daughter. A Rolls Royce stopped in front of Harrods, and a lady in a fur coat and diamond necklace got out. A tramp ran up to her and said, Please, lady, I haven't eaten for a week. Well... You will have to force yourself, was the reply. Eighty-first lesson. A little about England. Have you seen a map of England before? You must have noticed the number of large towns and cities. England is less centralised than France. Cities like Manchester and Bristol have an important cultural life of their own. A city is larger than a town and usually has a cathedral. Birmingham, Nottingham, Leicester and Southampton are all cities. And Guildford, Warwick and Gloucester are towns. There is a large and important difference between the north and the south of the country. 
a difference in the people, and a difference in the accent. You are learning to speak with a southern accent. England is divided into counties, of which there are about forty. Cornwall, the southern tip of England, is very wild and beautiful. In the north, Yorkshire is the largest county. Kent is called the Garden of England. Eighty-second lesson. Read this lesson as usual, and when you have finished it, answer the questions. What is the difference between a city and a town? Where would you find a cathedral? Is England as centralized as France? Are there any differences? Between the north and south of England, which accent are you learning? Which county is called the Garden of England? In which part of the country is Cornwall? Have you ever been to England? I want you all to write an essay. Said the teacher, Miss Smith, to her class, about what you would do if you won a fortune. Everybody started writing, except Willie, who looked out of the window. At the end of the lesson, the teacher collected the essays and saw that Willie had written nothing. But you've done nothing, Willie. That's what I'd do if I won a fortune. Nothing. Eighty-third lesson: shopping. Oh, I haven't done the shopping yet. I'd better go now, or it'll be too late. Let's see. We need some meat. I'll get some chops for tonight, and a joint of beef. I can put that in the freezer. Then vegetables. I'll buy some cabbage, some peas, and some rice. We've already got beetroot and lettuce. I'll buy some flour, and make a Yorkshire pudding, to eat with the roast beef on Sunday. What else do we need? Some toilet paper and some bleach, and some sweets for the kids. I think that's all. I can get everything at the supermarket. John, may I take the car? Yes. Do you want a hand? Ah,、oh, if you're not doing anything, that would be lovely. Let me watch the end of this program. All right. I'll take the car out of the garage and fetch the shopping bags. I won't be a minute, but I've been waiting to see this program for a week. Eighty-fourth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Eighty-fifth lesson. Two Sundays. David and Joan decided to go for a picnic in Richmond. On Sundays, David has a lie-in. And Joan brings him breakfast in bed. This Sunday, David got up at eleven o'clock, and after shaving and washing, went downstairs. Joan was preparing the picnic basket. She put in cold meat, hard-boiled eggs, some cold sausages, and a lettuce. She added a loaf of bread, some butter. And the knives and forks. Meanwhile, David got the car out of the garage. They put the basket in the boot, and set off for Bushy Park. On the way, David stopped to buy some wine. 
Bushy Park is a huge park on the outskirts of London. When they arrived, they found a quiet place and sat down on a rug to eat their lunch. Pass me some chicken, please, and some salt as well. Oh dear, said Joan. I think I've forgotten the salt. Idiot, said David. But seeing she was upset, he said, "Never mind. Let's have a glass of wine." He took the bottle out of the basket, then said, "Oh dear, I've forgotten the corkscrew." Eighty-sixth lesson. David's parents spent a traditional English Sunday. They got up early. And went to church. When they came back, Mrs. Wilson put the joint in the oven, while Mr. Wilson took the Sunday paper and sat down to read. Just before lunch, he poured two glasses of sherry, and they both drank. Mrs. Wilson served the food, and they sat down to eat. After lunch, which consisted of roast beef, potatoes, and Brussels sprouts, and fruit. They both did the washing up. When everything was put away, Mrs. Wilson went into the garden, and Mr. Wilson sat in front of the television. He was intending to watch a play, but he was full, and everything was so peaceful that he dozed. Later on, Mrs. Wilson came in from the garden, and made some tea. In the evening. Mr. Wilson did the crossword, while Mrs. Wilson did some knitting. Eighty-seventh lesson. A talkative neighbour. I must tell you about my holiday. Eventually, we had to go to France. We couldn't get a hotel anywhere in Spain. Have you ever been to France? No. Oh, you should go there some day. It's fascinating. We couldn't get a charter, so we had to take a normal flight, which was expensive, but it was worth it. It was much more comfortable. I should start planning my holidays soon. We've been talking about them for ages. Anyway. We flew to Nice and spent ten days in the south of France. When we couldn't find a hotel, we stayed in what they call pensions. They're like bed and breakfasts in London, but dearer. Then we flew up to Paris. You must know Paris. Yes, actually, I've been there a few times. Well, you should go back. It's an exciting city, and it's full of.、Uh, I really must go now. Joan will be waiting for me. Thanks for the chat. Eighty-eighth lesson. Hello, Joan. Sorry, I'm late. I've just met old Barker. He's so boring. He started telling me about his holiday. You must go here. You should go there. Well, actually. We should start thinking about our holiday, you know. Yes. Where did we say we would go? Well, you said we would go either to Spain or to Scotland. Ah, but I've also been thinking of Wales since I met a colleague who went there last year. Oh no! You promised we could go abroad this year. Yes, but that was before I received my bank statement. Wales is cheaper than Spain. Yes, but I want a suntan. I've even brought a new bikini. Well, it's sunny in Wales. The scenery's fantastic, and we're broke. You're impossible. I'm going to the travel agents tomorrow to book two seats on any plane. Good night. David sighed as Joan slammed the door. He sat down in an armchair. And poured himself a scotch, and began to look at the travel agent's brochures. Eighty-ninth 
Eighty-ninth lesson about Wales. Wales, unlike Scotland, is politically united to England. The whole of Wales is mountainous, and there is much breathtaking scenery. The main industry is coal mining, and the majority of the Welsh live around the industrial towns. These are in the south. The Welsh language, a Celtic language, survives more than in Scotland, but it is difficult to speak. The Welsh have a deep love of poetry and music, and the international festival is famous throughout the world. Wales has contributed much to the language and politics of England. The son and heir of the monarch is given the title, the Prince of Wales, but this has no political significance. Now answer these questions. Does the Welsh language still exist? What is the main industry in Wales? What is the scenery like? Who's the Prince of Wales? Ninetieth lesson. A Scotsman who was driving home one night ran into a car driven by an Englishman. The Scot got out of the car to apologise, and offered the Englishman a drink from a bottle of whisky. The Englishman was glad to have a drink. Go on," said the Scot. "Have another drink." The Englishman drank gratefully. But don't you want one? He asked the Scot. Perhaps, the other replied. When the police have gone. The barkeeper walked up to a tramp who was sleeping on a bench in Green Park. Hey, you! He shouted. I'm going to shut the park gates. All right," replied the tramp. "Try not to slam them." When Mrs. Davis told her husband that guests were coming to dinner that night, he went out into the hall and hid all the umbrellas. "What's the matter?" asked his wife. "Are you afraid someone will steal them?" "It's not that," replied her husband. But I'm afraid someone might recognise them. Ninety-first lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Ninety-second lesson. Jack. I'm freezing. Close the window. It's cold outside. You want me to get out of bed and close the window. But if I do, it won't be warm outside. Do tell me about Mrs. Haynes's divorce. I'd prefer you to ask Mrs. Haynes herself. We expect her to arrive at eight o'clock. I hope the train will be on time. I don't like waiting. He'd like them to introduce themselves, because he has forgotten their names. We've asked them to come round for drinks this evening, but they would like to come to dinner. Would you like me to make reservations for the theatre? No, thanks. I'll do it myself. I'd like you to say a prayer before your meal. But why? My mother's a good cook. Ninety-third lesson. He stopped smoking last week, and has been unbearable ever since. He enjoys teasing his wife about her spending, 
but to avoid causing an argument, he always agrees with her in the end. The criminal denied robbing the bank, but there were too many witnesses. Would you mind not smoking? This is a non smoking compartment. It's no use trying to run before you can walk. That new film about Switzerland is worth seeing. Imagine being a pop star. It must be great. A lady who felt sorry for a beggar invited him into the kitchen. On the table, there were some sardines and some smoked salmon. The beggar immediately began eating the smoked salmon. There are some sardines as well, said the lady in a loud voice. I prefer the smoked salmon, replied the beggar. But it's more expensive, complained his unwilling hostess. Yes, I know, lady, but it's worth it. Ninety fourth lesson A letter. Dear David, thanks very much for your last letter. I hope you are both well. I'm thoroughly enjoying my new job. The person whose position I've taken resigned last month. I can understand why, because there's a lot of work to do. I'm writing to ask you a favour. Could you get me some information on trade unions? I had to give a lecture last week and I couldn't find enough details. I should have asked you earlier, but you know how it is. Since I last saw you, nothing much has happened. I've been working hard for a month and I've had so little spare time. I saw Pete last week. You know, of course, that he's married. In fact, he's been married for over a year. He always used to say, Marriage is a great institution, but who wants to live in an institution? Look at him now. There's no more news, so I'll say goodbye. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. Your friend, George. Ninety fifth lesson A Favour. Oh, is that George's letter? I haven't seen him for a long time. In fact, since that party last year. How is he? Oh,、uh, he's fine. He needs some help with his new job. Yes. He's working in that school with a strange name. You mean Hungerford? It's a school that has an excellent reputation. How long has he been teaching there? For a month. Since another teacher resigned. He seems to be enjoying himself. May I read the letter? Of course. It's over there on top of the television. He always asks for information which is difficult to find. Not really. We've got lots of files at the office. I hope he doesn't expect you to write a book. No, just a few lines with the main points. It won't take too long. I hope not. I'll start straight away, and I should be finished by tomorrow at the latest. 96th lesson. Health. Do you remember in lesson 57, John had to see the doctor? In England, you do not pay the doctor or the hospital, and you pay only a small charge for the dentist. This is because of the National Health Service, which pays all medical costs. It is financed in part by contributions. 
called national insurance payments. Every working man or woman has to make a single national insurance contribution every week. It is the responsibility of the employer to make sure that the payments are made. He deducts a sum from the worker's wage or salary and then adds his own contribution. The rest of the money for the National Health Service comes from general taxation. Those whose incomes are too low can obtain what is called supplementary benefit. This is a weekly allocation and is financed entirely by general taxation. The state also pays pensions to people in retirement. These people are known as senior citizens. So when you go to the doctors or for something more serious, the hospital, you do not have to worry about the cost. Ninety seventh lesson. Learn this lesson as usual. Then answer the following questions with the help of the preceding lesson. How much did David have to pay the doctor when he was ill? What does National Health Service mean? How is the National Health Service financed? Whose responsibility is the weekly contribution? Who has to make national insurance contributions? Does the employer pay anything? Who receives supplementary benefit? Who are senior citizens? Two little boys who were visiting the British Museum. Stop to look at an Egyptian mummy. The mummy was covered with bandages and had a sign with 1,215 BC around its neck. I wonder what that sign means," said one of the boys. "Oh, that must be the number of the car which knocked him over," replied his friend. Ninety-eighth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Ninety-ninth lesson. Emergency. The ninety-ninth lesson reminds me of the police. Why? Because if there is an emergency and you need the police. Or an ambulance, or the fire brigade, you simply dial nine nine nine. The operator replies immediately. Emergency. Which service do you require? Excuse me, I'm a foreigner. Could you show me how to use the phone? Of course, sir. Have you got your number? If not, we can look it up in the directory. Right. Now, first, you lift the receiver and wait for the tone. Next, you dial your number, and wait until it rings. You must have ten pence ready. When the person answers, you push your coin into the slot and talk. You see, it's not at all complicated. Yes, I see. Thank you. You're very kind. Not at all. Goodbye. Hundredth lesson. This is our hundredth lesson. If you have spent an average of half an hour, revision included, on each of the preceding ones, it makes a total of nearly fifty hours. Are you pleased with the result of your work? Obviously, you do not know by heart every word and every expression we have seen. That would be too perfect. Learning a foreign language is a matter of patience, regular daily repetition, 
and optimism. Somebody once said that English was like Mount Everest because access is easy, but the summit is impossible to reach. We think this is wrong because nobody speaks his own language perfectly. You must try by regular practice to climb as high as you want until you feel comfortable. But be careful. In order not to fall, you must practice as often as possible. You will learn new words and expressions and forget them, and learn them again and forget them once more. But you are making progress. Compare what you know now with what you knew three months ago. The hardest and most tedious part of your work is done. Before long, you will speak fluently. But remember, in order to stay on the mountain, you need daily practice. Hundred and first lesson. Some stories. Believe me, all women are silly. I have only met one intelligent woman in my whole life. Why didn't you marry her then? I asked her, but she refused me. Have I shaved you before, sir? No, I got those scars during the war. Listen, Tommy. If you promise never to say that rude word again, I will give you ten pence. Oh, I know another that is worth at least fifty pence. The manager of a large firm criticized an employee for his inefficiency. The employee was so annoyed that he started criticizing the way in which the company was run. Are you the manager of this company? The manager asked him furiously. Of course not," said the employee. "Then don't talk like a fool," shouted the manager. A pessimist reminds us that a cup is half empty, and an optimist reminds us that it is half full. Hundred and second lesson. Outside the art gallery. I liked that exhibition very much, especially the modern painting of a man on a horse. How do you know it was a man on a horse? Well, it was obvious, wasn't it? In that case, it couldn't have been a modern painting. A mother had just scolded her son. And he started crying. At that moment, his father came in. What's the matter with you? He asked. The child turned his back and said nothing. Come on, said his father. Tell Daddy. The son turned round. If you must know, I've just had an argument with your wife. We're looking for someone who is used to ordering men. In that case, you want my wife. Do not forget to learn a few irregular verbs from time to time. Hundred and third lesson. An Englishman uses an average of one thousand words in his spoken vocabulary. His reading vocabulary is much larger, between three and four thousand, but many of these words are not used in everyday communication. When you come to the end of this course, you will be able to use about three thousand English words. The English vocabulary is composed of roughly fifty percent Latin words, and fifty percent Germanic ones, so there are often two words. To describe the same thing, but don't worry. Only those who do crossword puzzles or play word games 
Know the thousands of unusual words in the language. English also adopts words very easily, so that often people do not realize that they are foreign words. So all nationalities feel at home speaking English. Doctor, tell me frankly what is wrong with me? Not in Latin or Greek, but in simple, plain words. There's nothing wrong with you. You're a drunkard and a glutton. Oh. Well, say it in Latin and Greek so I can tell my wife. Hundred and fourth lesson Aphorisms. Don't criticize society. Only those who can't get into it do that. The only way to get rid of a temptation is to yield to it. An ex president revisiting the White House. It's a nice place to visit, but I prefer to live here. The best way to forget your troubles is to wear tight shoes. An enthusiastic young priest. What a beautiful moon! And it's in my parish. Money cannot buy you friends, but it can buy you a better class of enemy. Man, to a woman who accused him of being drunk. Madam, you are ugly, but tomorrow I will be sober. It's not that money makes everything good, it's that no money makes everything bad. The only way to behave to a woman. Is to make love to her if she is beautiful, and to someone else if she is plain. Your health comes first. You can hang yourself later. A fool is someone who walks into his friend's antique shop and shouts, "What's new?" Hundred and fifth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Hundred and sixth lesson. We must make a decision. We must decide where to go for our holidays. We should have decided months ago. I'll be down in a minute. I've got to finish this article I'm writing. Have you got everything you need? Yes, thanks. Joan picked up a brochure and read, "To be sure of obtaining a place, it is necessary to book well in advance." And in another one, "You must book early to avoid the rush." Joan was very angry, because it was already the middle of June and they had done nothing. Well, if you're going to do something, you should do it properly. She thought. She looked through the pile of brochures, and then went to make a cup of tea. David, having finished his article, came downstairs. He stopped and picked up the post from the mat. Oh, look! Still more brochures. We've got more than we need. Joan was furious. You need a stick of dynamite to move you, she shouted. Oh come on, don't be angry. Make the tea. Make it yourself, shouted Joan, and went out, slamming the door. David scratched his head. But what did I do? Hundred and seventh lesson: Too many experts. Despite the fact that there are many more jobs today than twenty years ago, computer operators, airline pilots, television engineers, even astronauts, unemployment remains a serious problem. We are in the age of specialization and the expert. Students are no longer safe studying a general subject like literature. To be sure of a job, they must specialize. 
Some people work by telling others what to do. There are educational experts, scientific experts, all sorts of expert. There is a saying which goes, "Too many chiefs, and not enough Indians." Sometimes, this is the case in modern industry. Also, people don't always work as efficiently as they could. There is a law which states, "Work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion." It means that if you have two hours to do a job, whatever it is, the job will take two hours, even if you could finish it sooner. Hundred and eighth lesson: Jobs and industry. Let's look at some of the occupations available to people today. As a tradesman, you can be a butcher, a greengrocer, a baker. You can be an ironmonger, a milliner, a jeweller, or a bookseller, etc. As a craftsman, you can be a joiner, a goldsmith, a watchmaker, or a fitter. There are also manual workers, such as bricklayers. Then there are the professions: teacher, doctor, lawyer, or broker. Military service was abolished in England in May 1963, so the armed services are also considered as a career. There are many problems in industry today. Strikes are frequent. And often serious. The trade unions, which look after their members' interests, do not always agree with the employers. If coal miners or railwaymen go on strike, the results can be very serious for the country. Such problems are known as industrial relations. Hundred and ninth lesson. Another look. We have seen many new words recently. Let's revise some of them. We should have bought a new fridge before the prices went up. No, thank you. I already have more than I need. Everyone needs money, but some need more than others. If the dockers go on strike. We'll have to stay in the ship. Unemployment benefit is available to those who need it. My son, the doctor, is four, and the lawyer is three. I hate walking past the jewellers with my girlfriend. Would you look after the baby while I go to the shops? Identity cards were abolished in England after the war. My boss and I don't always agree. He picked up a penny outside the bank, and the manager employed him. If you work in this factory, you must join a trade union. We've got to agree on a solution soon. Hundred and tenth lesson. Thank you very much for all your help. Not at all. Dial this number and ask for Mr. Smith's secretary. The person whose motorbike was stolen last week is complaining. That couldn't have been David. He didn't say hello. She is used to looking after people. She is a nurse. At present, she is working in a hospital, but next month she is changing jobs. I was charged twenty francs for a cup of tea in Paris. Excuse me, I'm a foreigner. Could you help me? I'm lost. But you speak English very well. I should speak it better. If I learned my lessons better, I would speak it fluently.
George spent three months on the Riviera last year. Oh, lucky George! It's not worth buying a new record player. I might get one for my birthday. I wasn't aware she spoke Chinese. Neither was she. Horses are very strong animals. Hundred and eleventh lesson. Clever answers. Why have you put my novel with the medical books? Because I found it excellent for sending people to sleep. What is wrong with this sentence? The horse and the cow is in the field. Please, miss. Please, miss. Ladies first. How do you protect yourself against impure water? I drink beer. Granddad, a baby was fed on elephant's milk and gained twenty pounds in a week. That's impossible. Whose baby? Ha! <laughs> the elephant's. An aunt wanted to see which of her nieces was the most polite. So she put one small apple and one big one on a plate. Let's see who has the best manners. She has," said Joan, taking the biggest. Do not forget to learn a few irregular verbs from time to time. Hundred and twelfth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Hundred and thirteenth lesson. Another little mystery. I had a problem last week," said Mister Hind to his friend the inspector. When my father died. I inherited his fortune of several million pounds. But last week, Greg came to see me. He used to be the gardener until I fired him in December. He told me that just before my father died, he was working outside his window, and he heard Dad drawing up a new will in favour of my brother. My father and I had argued about something at the end of November, so it was possible that he had decided to alter the will. Greg told me that the document was in his possession, and that he would sell it to me for fifty thousand pounds. He said it was dated November the thirty-first, three days after the first will. So it was worth a lot of money to me. When I refused, he tried to bargain with me. First, he asked for twenty-five thousand pounds, and then finally ten thousand. I hope you didn't give him anything," said the inspector. Huh. "Only my foot in his backside," said Hind. What was Greg's mistake? The answer is in lesson one hundred and nineteen. One hundred and fourteenth lesson: make and do. Here are a few examples of these two verbs. Try and learn these sentences, but it's really a question of practice. What is she doing? She's making a birthday cake for her daughter. Before you go out, please make your bed and do the washing up. Is he doing well in his new job? Yes, he's making a great deal of money. They always make mistakes with this new maths. I speak English. 
and enough German to make myself understood. Make him another offer. I think he'll accept. I will have nothing to do with his firm. I don't trust him. If you want something done well, do it yourself. With all this selection, it is difficult to make a choice. He was doing a hundred miles an hour on the motorway when the police stopped him. When you have read this lesson, do the exercises. At the official opening of Parliament, the monarch makes a speech. Hundred and fifteenth lesson: Make and do. Some more examples of make and do. He's making a film about living conditions in a peasant village. I needed his help. But all he could do was make jokes. They are busy making preparations for their holiday. The smell of good cooking makes my mouth water. You're going to marry a millionaire? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I have no coffee. You'll have to make do with tea. He always succeeds in making me angry. Please make up your mind. We don't have very much time, and the shop is going to close. Whatever you look at nowadays, you will see, made in Hong Kong. Mrs. Richards' guests were admiring a large stuffed shark that was mounted on her wall. My husband and I caught it on a fishing trip," said the proud owner. What is it stuffed with? Asked one lady. My husband, replied their hostess. Hundred and sixteenth lesson. Let's go to Oxford. On Sunday, David decided he would go and see his parents, who lived in Oxford. They wanted to leave early to avoid the crowds. So they got up at half past six. By seven o'clock, they were ready. They got into the car and set off. Have you got everything? Said Joan. Of course I have. I rang Dad last night and told him we would arrive at about ten. They took the motorway and were soon driving quickly towards Oxford. Ah,、oh, I'm sure we've forgotten something. Said Joan. No, the presents are on the back seat, and the book Dad wanted is in the glove compartment. Our overnight bag is in the boot. What could we have forgotten? They drove on in silence. Joan looked at the countryside, and from time to time glanced at the speedometer to make sure they were not breaking the speed limit. How far to go? Only another fifty miles. We'll be there in an hour. Suddenly, the motor coughed, and the car began to slow down. Damn! I know what I forgot. I forgot to fill the tank before leaving. Hundred and seventeenth lesson: a slight misunderstanding. Fortunately. There was a can of petrol in the boot. David put that into the tank, and they drove on to a service station. Fill her up," said David. "And you better check the oil." "Why don't we go and have a cup of coffee?" said Joan. "Okay, fine. When he's finished, I'll join you." Joan got out of the car, and walked towards the cafeteria. She stopped at a kiosk to buy a magazine, and then went into the cafe and bought two coffees. David arrived five minutes later, and sat down. I'm sorry, love. I should have listened to you. You said we'd forgotten something, and you were right. 
Yes. It's silly to run out of petrol on the motorway. You ought to have checked before. All right. I said I was sorry, didn't I? Let's finish our coffee and leave. They got back into the car and continued their journey in silence. Joan read her magazine, and an hour later they arrived in Oxford. A hundred and eighteenth lesson at the Wilsons. Oxford looked very beautiful that morning. It's not for nothing that it's called the City of Spires. They drove through the centre and soon arrived at the quiet street where David's parents lived. David's father greeted them at the door. Hello, you look well. Come in. Did you have a good trip? David and Joan looked at one another uncomfortably. Uh, yes, thanks. It was all right. Put your bags down there and come into the front room. David's mother was sitting in front of the fire. She stood up as they came in and kissed them both. Joan took a parcel from behind her back and gave it to Mrs. Wilson. It's just a little something I found in a, I mean, in an antique shop. Mrs. Wilson opened the parcel and took out a small silver box. Oh, it's lovely! She cried. But what is it? Well, it's Victorian. It's a thing. <sighs> oh, good. You don't know either. I can't offend you, can I? I think I'll put my earrings in it. Hundred and nineteenth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Hundred and twentieth lesson. Some traditions. It is often said that the English are conservative. I prefer to hear it said that they are traditionalist. There are many traditions and customs in Britain, and some may appear strange to foreigners. For example, on October the thirty-first, one can see children making masks from pumpkins, and putting candles inside to frighten witches. This is called Halloween, and is the day before All Saints' Day. Just before Easter, on Good Friday, you can buy hot cross buns. These are delicious spicy cakes with a cross on them, to remind us of the crucifixion. The day after Christmas is called Boxing Day. This is because. Householders used to give little presents or boxes to the tradesmen who had served them. Nowadays, it is usual to give money. Perhaps the most spectacular tradition is Bonfire Night or Guy Fawkes Night. This takes place on the fifth of November, and celebrates the arrest in sixteen o five of Guy Fawkes. Who attempted to blow up the Houses of Parliament? Today, people celebrate by lighting bonfires, setting off fireworks, and burning effigies called guys. Hundred and twenty-first lesson. Some more traditions. If you go to the Tower of London, you will see six ravens. These birds. Or rather, their ancestors have been there since the eleventh century. But today, they are there for a very important reason. According to tradition, the British Empire will remain only as long as there are ravens in the tower. No one knows the reason for this legend, but there are many suggestions. One is that a gang of thieves broke into the tower. While the sentries were asleep, 
but the ravens made so much noise that the sentries woke up and were able to kill the thieves. Whatever the reason, the birds are fed every day and receive a state pension. Scotland and Ireland too are full of legend and tradition. In Scotland, Christmas is not a big feast. For the Scots, New Year's Day is more important. This is called hogmany. At midnight, a tall, dark man must cross the threshold of your house, carrying a lump of coal, a piece of bread, and a bottle of whisky. These items symbolize warmth, food, and drink for the coming year. Hundred and twenty-second lesson: Meeting a client at the airport. David was waiting near the arrival lounge at Heathrow's Terminal One. He was waiting for a client who was coming from Geneva. The loudspeaker crackled, and he heard a voice say, "British Airways announced the arrival of Flight One O Seven from Geneva." David started looking for his client. He knew that the man would be wearing a carnation in his buttonhole, and carrying a copy of the Sunday Times under his arm. He caught sight of the man, who was tall and grey-haired with long sideboards. He went forward and said, "You must be Mr. Lagarde. I'm David Wilson. How do you do?" They shook hands. David picked up the man's case and said, "Follow me, will you? My car is in the car park. It's just outside." When they were driving towards London, David said, "I'll take you to your hotel first, then we'll get some lunch." Mr. Lagarde replied, "Thank you. I'm staying at the Churchill. My secretary booked the room by telex." At the hotel. The doorman took Mr. Lagarde's case, and another servant parked the car. The two men went to the reception desk. My name's Lagarde. I have a single room reserved. Yes, sir. Room two three seven. The hall porter will show you up. Hundred and twenty-third lesson. How is your English getting on? Have you noticed that every day you are learning new words and expressions? You can now hold conversations, read notices, ask your way, even argue with someone. We must continue to add new material every day, so that at the end of the course, you will be able to understand English as it is spoken by the English. We hope that you find time to revise the past lessons. And that, above all, you do it aloud. This is vital, because it helps you to remember and to improve your pronunciation. You will always have a slight accent, but don't worry. People will be able to understand you, which is most important. And besides, a slight foreign accent is charming. There are certain expressions which you cannot really translate. So you can say them in your own language, and people will say, "How charming!" So revise and read aloud every day as much as you can. You will find that your English is becoming more and more natural. Hundred and twenty-fourth lesson: a little revision. In order to help you with your task of revision. Today and tomorrow, we will look again at some of the words we have seen recently, together with a few new ones. This sentence may appear difficult to you, but actually it is simple. From the top of the post office tower, you can see the whole of London. Indian cooking is delicious, but it can be very spicy. I bought this overcoat secondhand. Does it suit me? So long as you warn me first, you can take the lawnmower when you like. 
On November the 5th, people set off fireworks, light bonfires, and burn guys. Although he's very intelligent, he won't pass the exam. He hasn't worked. My car is parked just outside the cinema. I have a room reserved in the name of Wilson. Whatever he wants, tell him to go away. I'm far too busy. Inside the tower, ravens could be seen eating from silver bowls. Would you mind waiting for ten minutes? Mr. Wilson is not back yet. Hundred and twenty fifth lesson. A little revision. According to my dictionary, this word means carefree. During the night, a burglar broke into the castle and stole all her jewels. You erase it with a rubber, not a robber, you silly thing. The advertisement says that if you pour milk onto this cereal, it will crackle. He bought two second-hand loudspeakers for his stereo, but they didn't work. It was a bad bargain. There is a button missing from this jacket, or else I've got an extra buttonhole. I have no change for the cigarette machine. Lend me fifty pence, will you? You ought to stop smoking. It's bad for your health. Your health," said the barman. "Cheers," said the customer. "Let me introduce you to Mr. Legard. He has just arrived from Geneva. He seems a pleasant man. What does he do? He's a dentist. Then I was wrong. He's an unpleasant man." You will speak English more and more fluently if you revise a little every day. Hundred and twenty-sixth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Hundred and twenty seventh lesson. The news. Would you mind if I turned on the television, David? I want to listen to the news. Of course not. This is the BBC. It is six o'clock, and here is the news. The government today announced that it would resign. The prime minister made the announcement in a speech to the Commons this afternoon. The decision was taken in the light of the recent defeat of the government's prices and incomes policy, and also recent defeats in local by-elections. A general election is expected next month. The civil war in Rutania continues. The military junta, which last month overthrew the government, appealed today to America for military aid. At home again, the recent strike by tool makers at Dagwood's car plant has finished. The men are expected to return to work on Wednesday. A gorilla escaped from London Zoo and attacked four passers-by. It was later recaptured safely and returned to its cage. A spokesman for London Zoo said that the animal probably felt lonely. Finally, the weather forecast: the night will be fine with scattered showers in the north. And that's the end of the news. Hundred and twenty-eighth lesson: problems. Oh, doctor, help me! I keep talking to myself. Don't worry, sir. It's not uncommon. In fact, thousands of people do it. Yes, but doctor, you don't realize how stupid I sound. At their first meeting, a psychiatrist asked his patient a few standard questions. What is the difference between a little boy and a dwarf? He asked.、Oh, there could be a lot of difference," replied the patient. "What, for example?" "Well, the dwarf could be a girl," came the reply. 
Hello. I haven't seen you for ages. Have a drink. No, thanks. I never drink. Really? Why not? Well, I don't believe in drinking in front of my children. And when I'm away from them, I don't need to drink. Your girlfriend is good looking. But she limps. Well, only when she walks. 129th lesson. A few idioms. Here are a few idiomatic expressions you might meet when you go to England. Ay! I've been sitting down for too long. I've got pins and needles in my foot. He put on his new coat inside out, and you could see the price tag. He was a very blunt man who called a spade a spade. It's not difficult to do, but there's a knack to it. If you wait for a bus at a request stop, you must put out your hand to make the bus stop. My husband doesn't understand me. He takes me for granted. When you buy on higher purchase, you make a down payment of £50 and then 16 monthly instalments of £8. All the fruit had gone bad, but she couldn't stand the idea of throwing it away. He pretended to be a millionaire, but actually he was broke. We will have to put off the meeting until next Thursday since nobody is free. I hope we can eat soon. I'm starved. Daddy asked me if I wanted a sports car or a yacht. <laughs> I couldn't care less. What's on at the Gaumont this week? Doesn't make any difference to me. I'm hard up. Hundred and thirtieth lesson. Letters. In this lesson and the next one, we will look at different sorts of letter. Dear Mike. I'm writing to thank you and your wife for having us last weekend. We thoroughly enjoyed ourselves, and it was so nice to see you and Mary again. It was nice, too, to see London after all this time. Life in the suburbs is quiet, but sometimes a bit too quiet. On the way home, we gave a lift to a hitchhiker, a young student going back to university. We had a long chat. You know what Joan's like. And it seems that student life has changed from the life you and I knew. For a start, the kid was studying social anthropology, which I always thought had something to do with monkeys. Then he told us that he didn't attend lectures, but spent his time preparing political meetings. At the weekend, he goes to demonstrations. In our day, it wouldn't have been allowed, would it? Do I sound old and intolerant? I suppose I am, really. Thanks again for your hospitality, and I look forward to seeing you both again soon. Kindest regards to you and your wife. Yours, David. Hundred and thirty first lesson A Business Letter Today we see a letter from someone who is applying for a job. Dear Sir, I have just read your advertisement in the Situations Vacant column of the Times. I wish to apply for the post of bilingual secretary which you are offering. I am twenty three years old and single live in London and own a car. After qualifying from St Dunstan's Secretarial College in 1974, I worked for two years in France. I was based in the Bordeaux region and was working for an import-export firm. While there, I perfected my French, which I write and speak perfectly. I also type and know both English and French shorthand. 
I will be free from March the 23rd, as my firm is being taken over by a French company. I hope I may be granted an interview. Yours faithfully, Marjorie Watson. Perhaps she will be lucky. Here is the reply she received. Dear Miss Watson, Thank you for replying to our advertisement so promptly. If you would like to come to my office on the 23rd of March at 10 o'clock, I will be glad to give you an interview and a short test in bilingual correspondence. Please confirm this appointment by return of post or by telephoning my secretary. Yours sincerely, John Hind. Hundred and thirty second lesson. More about letters. Did you notice how simple the style of the last letter was? In an English letter, and especially a business letter, it is better to be as direct as possible. There are no frills or extravagant salutations, and the style is plain. Our Miss Watson could have written her life history or talked about her brother in law, but she did not, and it worked. Simplicity always pays. In official correspondence, the English use many abbreviations. For example, is written EG. That is to say, is written IE, from the Latin id est. The 24 hour clock is not widely used in Britain. It is used mainly on the railways, which might explain why the trains are so often late. So instead, English people write AM to indicate the morning and PM for the afternoon and evening. EG, 10 AM, 9.30 PM. Other abbreviations you might find come after people's names, like BA, Bachelor of Arts, or MSc, Master of Science. You could also come across VC or DSO, or any of the numerous military or civilian decorations. Twice a year, the Queen draws up an honours list, which decorates people who have given service to the nation. Hundred and thirty third lesson Revision and Notes No recording for this lesson. Hundred and thirty fourth lesson A visit to England. Pierre has met his English friend Tony, and they are drinking beer together on the Champs Elysees. So I hear you've been to England recently. Tell me about your trip. Well, as I had a long weekend, I decided to take advantage of it. I was going to travel by boat, but then I read an advertisement for the hovercraft. I had never taken one before, so I thought it would be an adventure. I went by train to Boulogne. At the hoverport, I bought some duty free cigarettes. Then the hovercraft arrived. It was very impressive, like a huge sea monster. Not only does it carry passengers, but also cars, coaches, and even lorries. Eventually, when everyone was on board, the thing rose up on a cushion of air and set off. You couldn't see anything through the windows because there was too much spray. It was fantastic. In only half an hour, we were in Dover. My first impressions weren't marvelous. It was raining. As I got out of the hovercraft and headed for the customs, I suddenly realized that I was in a foreign country. Everything was in English, and I suddenly began to panic. I went through the nothing to declare lane and got onto a coach to go to the station. I hadn't spoken a word. And no one had spoken to me. Hundred and 
135th lesson. Arrival in London. On the train, I managed to relax a little and look at the countryside. It's true what they say. England is beautiful and green, even in the rain. I started reading my guidebook and looking for addresses of hotels and bed and breakfasts. The door of my compartment suddenly opened and a man in uniform said, Tickets, please! The first words someone had spoken to me, and I had understood them. I took my courage in both hands and asked, uh, What time do we arrive in London? We'll be at Charing Cross in about an hour, sir. I still understood. I was now very excited. I had found the address of a cheap hotel and I couldn't wait to arrive. A Charing Cross is like any big railway station, big, noisy and crowded. Outside I found a taxi, sorry, a cab, and gave the driver the address. Driving in London was heaven compared to Paris. Everyone was much more polite and calm, but they were driving on the wrong side of the road. The hotel I had chosen was in Kensington, so I saw quite a lot of London from the cab. At last, we arrived at the hotel, I paid the driver and gave him a tip. Hundred and thirty sixth lesson Conversions. The hotel was fine. Small but comfortable and only £35 a night with breakfast. I checked in, put my case in my room and set out to discover London. Tony interrupted. You were lucky, you know. £35 a night is very cheap. You could have paid up to £60 and for a small room too. I know, said Pierre. But London is cheaper than Paris, except the tube. That's much dearer and far less modern than our metro. I decided straight away to walk everywhere. I even bought a pair of shoes. That was a bit of a problem. The salesman asked, What size do you take? I had no idea. Fortunately, he had a conversion table. You take a size 42. That makes you nine and a half. And we have a nice pair in the sales. Only fifty pounds, reduced from one hundred pounds. I got a bargain. I put my old shoes in a bag and walked out in my new ones. I had no idea London was so large. It took me an hour to walk to Trafalgar Square. I wanted to look at the paintings in the National Gallery. I had another nice surprise. It was free. Hundred and thirty seventh lesson. After an hour's walking and an hour's culture, I felt hungry. I looked in vain for an English restaurant, but there wasn't one in sight. I could have eaten pizza, crepe, hamburgers, but no English food. So I went into a pub and had a pint of beer and a sandwich. Then I continued my explorations. One thing struck me. The theatres and cinemas were all cheaper than at home. A good seat in a theatre was about ten pounds. I made up my mind to go and see a play before leaving. My first day was exhausting. I saw so much that I can't remember everything. I noticed how the Londoners I saw seemed calmer, even at five o'clock during the rush hour. Another thing that impressed me was the number of parks, St. James, Hyde Park, Green Park, and you were allowed to walk on the grass. I went to Speaker's Corner and listened to somebody talking about immigration. He said the country was full of foreigners, so <laughs> I went away quietly. 138th Lesson I had changed my money in England and had got a good rate for my francs. 
I did some shopping and bought all the traditional things that tourists buy. Shetland pullovers, a tweed jacket. I was even going to buy a dinner jacket, but it would have been a little too extravagant. The night before I left, I went to see a musical. As you know, we don't have many in Paris, so I was looking forward to it very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. The acting, the singing and the costumes were all so professional. Leaving the theatre was like coming out into another world. I had a late supper, this time in an excellent Chinese restaurant. The next day, I packed my bags and my souvenirs, said goodbye to everybody and strolled to the station. The journey back was less pleasant. I was unhappy to leave and the channel was very rough that day. If you are in a boat on a rough sea, you roll. But in a hovercraft, you go up and down as in a lift. Several people were sick, so I had a large brandy to strengthen myself. Hundred and thirty ninth lesson Mothers. My son Thomas is doing very well on the stage. He writes and says that every night he plays a villager, a gypsy, and two soldiers, whereas the star of the play, a Mr. Hamlet, only plays one part. A young man was sitting in the lounge of a large hotel. Sipping a glass of punch. A little girl came up to him and said, What's your name? The young man told her his name. Are you married? she asked. No, said the man. The little girl was quiet for a moment. Then she turned to a woman standing nearby and shouted, Ah,、uh, what else did you tell me to ask him, Mummy? Young Jimmy was greedily eating a bar of chocolate. His father said angrily, I've told you not to eat between meals. Did you ask Mum if you could have that chocolate? Yes, said Jimmy. Come on, I want the truth. A pause. Yes, I did. And she said, No. The man who is tired of London is tired of life. Dr. Johnson. Hundred and fortieth lesson. Revision and notes. No recording for this lesson. Hundred and forty first lesson. Do you remember? Ask him if you can borrow the lawnmower. I did, and he said no. He told me that he needed it today. What could I say? You could have said that the grass needed cutting. Well, never mind. I was struck by the calm of the Londoners I met. Nelson's column is very impressive. The bronze lions at the foot are made from French cannons. I like paintings, and the paintings in the National Gallery were marvellous. I hardly spoke any English. Would you believe it? Everyone I met was French. He said he couldn't wait. He had an urgent appointment and had to leave. She must have left because her car isn't in the garage. If we had thought of it earlier, you could have come with us. He might have come while I was out, but he would have left a message. I was able to understand everything they said. Despite the fact that most of them had heavy accents. You bought so many souvenirs, you must have spent a fortune. 
She made up her mind to study medicine, despite her father's advice. Tell him to come straight away. We're late already, and I don't want to miss the beginning. Hundred and forty-second lesson: English or American? It was either Oscar Wilde or George Bernard Shaw. Who said that England and America are divided by the same language? Whoever it was ought to have said, "American and English are two similar languages." An Englishman can feel more disorientated in the United States than a Frenchman or a German. For example, he will be told he is walking on a sidewalk instead of a pavement. To go up to the third floor of his hotel, he takes the elevator, and not the lift. If he wishes to travel around New York, he must take the subway, and not the underground. Whereas in London, the subway is a passage under a busy street. He must never ask for the toilet, but always the bathroom or the restroom. In some public places, he might even hear it called. The comfort station. To wash his hands, he opens a faucet instead of turning on a tap. Thanks to the television, however, many English people and especially teenagers are familiar with these words. Spelling too is different, thanks to a New York teacher called Noah Webster. In 1828, he published his American Dictionary of the English Language. Not all his reforms were adopted, but certain spellings were accepted and exist today. English words that end in o u r, e g, neighbor, favor, honor, are written without the u in American, and words that end in r e, theater, center, are written as they are pronounced, i e, theater. T h e a t e r, center, c e n t e r, in American. Hundred and forty third lesson. When Pierre was in London, he had with him a list of useful expressions. Let's have a look at them. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. Please excuse me. I wonder if you could help me. Could you tell me? Would you repeat that, please? Thank you. I'm very grateful. That's very kind of you. Would you mind? Is the seat taken? May I sit down? It doesn't matter. It's not important. I don't mind. Of course, of course not. I'm delighted to meet you. Give my regards to your wife. What a pity! I'm afraid I won't be able to come. I'd love to. Did you have a good trip? How was the crossing? How was the weather? Could you tell me the way to? Is there a bank near here? Where? Could you tell me the time, please? It's rather late. I seem to be early. Where do you come from? I'm from Lyon. We've just arrived. Do you know a good restaurant? There might be one in Oxford Street. I'm afraid I can't help you. I'm a foreigner. I don't know London. Hundred and forty-fourth lesson. In a bank. I'd like to change some money. What is the rate today? 
twenty pounds in five pound notes and ten in one pound notes. Do you have any change? May I use my cheque book? In a post office. I'd like to send a telegram. How much per word? I need some stamps. How much is it to send a postcard to France? I'd like to cash this money order. At the hotel. I'd like a single room, please. Oh, you only have a double left. Does the room have a shower and a toilet? If anyone calls while I'm out, could you take a message? Please prepare my bill. I'm leaving in the morning. Shopping. I'm afraid I don't know my size. Do you have anything smaller? May I try it on? Oh, it doesn't fit very well. It doesn't suit me. I'll think it over. It's a little too expensive. I'll come back later. Hundred and forty-fifth lesson: signs and notices. Way in. Entrance. Way out. Exit. No admittance. Private. Admission free. Inquiries. No smoking. Spitting prohibited. Do not lean out of the window. Public conveniences, gents, ladies, house full. The management is not responsible for loss or damage to guests' property. Early closing day. Closed for lunch. Closed for repairs. One-way street. Keep left. Cul-de-sac. No U-turns. Sometimes notices are a waste of time. This was George Bernard Shaw's opinion when he saw a fishmonger outside his shop. Trying to put up a notice. On the board was written, "Fresh fish sold here." Where can I put it? There's no room. My good man, your sign is useless," said Shaw. "Why?" inquired the other. "Fresh. Would you sell stale fish?" Shaw deleted the word with a piece of chalk. Fish, one can see and smell perfectly well that you do not sell tablecloths. The second word was crossed out. Sold. Since when has a fishmonger given away his merchandise? And this last word is ridiculous," he said, putting a line through the word here. It is evident. That you do not sell your fish elsewhere. Good day, sir. Hundred and forty-sixth lesson. Our last lesson. You have reached the last lesson, but not the end. You can congratulate yourself, because the bulk of the work has been completed. From now on. It'll be plain sailing. Of course, you cannot expect to speak like an Englishman after only a few months of part-time study, but now you know something about the country and its customs. If you went to England now, you could get by fairly easily. But remember the motto of the Méthode Assimile: daily practice.
So, don't let this book collect dust at the back of a shelf. Pick it up from time to time and read a paragraph or an anecdote. Repeat them out loud. Then do the second wave lesson. Learn the irregular verbs. In short, keep in touch. By reading the newspapers, listening to records and the radio, by taking every opportunity to speak, and by not being afraid of making mistakes, you will feel the language and use it naturally. We hope you've enjoyed using this method and that you'll enjoy speaking English painlessly.